even though they've enriched to over 50 percent they've still got to get over 90 percent and if they no longer have the capability of progressing the enrichment even though they've done most of the work getting 50 percent right they can't get to that weapons grade material which means that it can't be used for a weapon but we can see the pictures of the huge craters left by america's massive bombs on a mountainside in iran they're on the times app and on the front page of the times as well what state does that leave iran's nuclear program so robin grimes was the chief scientific advisor on nuclear sites at the ministry of defense he joins us now robin good morning to you good morning um how much has how much has it been affected compromised eliminated iran's nuclear program so what these uh, nuclear facilities do is increase the amount of uranium-235. That's the isotope you need for making a weapon. Uh, it starts out an incredibly small amount, and then it, you have to build it up from 0.7% to over 90% for it to be a weapons-grade material. That takes an incredible amount of chemical engineering, very sensitive um, type of equipment, a bomb down a hole, will disrupt that very significantly, probably destroying it and probably releasing uh, the material, causing a chemical uh, concern rather than a radiological concern. Is that I why there's been no radiation? Is that why there's been no radiation av available? You think that you think the thing could have been destroyed without creating creating any radiation? Yeah, you've got it. Absolutely. This is um, in the centrifuges. The uranium is in the form of a gas um, called uranium hexafluoride which is very toxic, nasty stuff, but it doesn't cause a big radiation hazard. <clears throat> and I'm thinking from the IAEA's measurements that that confirms, as one would expect, that there's been no nuclear type of event. Um, there is a suggestion that 408 kilograms of, in, of enriched uranium to 60% could have been moved uh, from um, these facilities. Yeah. Is that plausible, do you think? Where yeah, might that's, that a really be? Good, that's a really good and absolutely pertinent question. So remember, again, this is in the form of uranium hexafluoride. Um, so they will have had to have probably converted that, or they're going to have very large containers uh, with the uranium hexafluoride in them. Um, and I would have thought we would have seen those um, moved, and that hasn't been reported. I mean, it hasn't occurred. But um even though they've enriched to over 50 percent they've still got to get over 90 percent and if they no longer have the capability of progressing the enrichment even though they've done most of the work getting 50 percent right they can't get to that weapons grade material which means that it can't be used for a weapon and that's dependent and then the question is do they have any facilities which the israelis and the americans don't know about which haven't been bombed by the US over the weekend? Yeah, again, that's a really important question. Um, so these facilities, it's like uh, it, hundreds of very large, very fast spinning, interconnected by incredible amounts of pipe work sort of structure. And it takes an incredible amount of energy to run it. So if they do have facilities to do that, there would be an energy signature, which is basically the way you pick these things up from satellites and so forth. So if they do have that, then it ought to have been pretty straightforward to spot it. Doesn't mean 100% that they don't have it, but I think the Americans and the Israelis would have known about that. So I suspect they don't. So they don't have the facility, but they might have the uranium enriched to 60% and we'll see what they do. And can we, can, how, do we yeah. get, how do we get that? How can that be then be obtained by, or, or, or accessed by the West? Would Iran have to give it up as part of a negotiation? Absolutely, yes. Um, remember that I Iran is theoretically bound by a set of treaty obligations, a non-proliferation treaty, which they are a, mem a member of, also, actually, even the Iran deal still, uh, even though it's in complete abeyance. Uh, and uh, as that, they would, if there was a new version of that, they'd have to give up these sorts of materials. Yeah, and whether that can happen now with a diplomacy can function in a post-bomb world, Who knows? we will find out. Robin, really interesting stuff. That's so, 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 such, such good insight. Thank you so much. That's Sir Robin Grimes there, that, who used to be the Chief Scientific Advisor on Nuclear Science at the Ministry of Defence. Well, given we now have an understanding of what Iran might be capable of and what its next steps could be in terms of that process, let's turn to Benoit Faucon, who is the Middle East correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, to work out what Iran's next move might be in terms of its military objectives. Uh, morning, Benoit. Good morning. Um, what do you think will be Tehran's next steps here? 
So the step is kind of ongoing as we speak. It's uh, the meeting with Putin and the um, Iranian Foreign Minister Abbas Arakshi. Um, I think it's actually taking place now. It's just started. Um, and the idea is count your friends. You know, uh, it hasn't worked with European diplomacy, uh, Western European diplomacy, French, German, and UK. Hasn't worked with Oman mediation with the US. So what remains is kind of the, the stable relationship um, with Russia, China, and I think more recently, Turkey. Um, and so the, the meeting with Putin is kind of crucial to help Iran determine its response. I mean, this morning, Arakshi said, you know, in in, um, in Russia that he, he feels the, Nash, the, the nuclear uh, a proliferation treaty hasn't worked for Iran, that it hasn't protected it and provided guarantee that were, um, you know, on both sides. Uh, and so he was kind of questioning, as Iran has done more and more in recent weeks, whether he will still belong to that treaty, whether he will leave that treaty. That's one question uh, they expected to discuss today. And obviously, if they decide to leave, then we have no way to know if they get a nuclear weapon. Now, of course, uh, as you mentioned just earlier, uh, you know, there's a real question mark whether they could actually develop a nuclear weapon anymore and, and therefore whether that would be relevant to leave the, the treaty in, you know, in the short term. Long term is a different story. They've shown that for a long time, you know, they can rebuild their program and et cetera. And in this case, there will be no limitations technically. So France won Russia. Uh, France to China, French free uh, Turkey. The second step is once they see, which they will likely see that diplomacy doesn't work, the UN is not going to step in and condemn the US attack because it will be vetoed by the US and others. Then they will calibrate the response. And I understand, again, in conversation with other players that are still friendly to them, uh, one thing that is pretty obvious is uh, Iraq. Obviously, the U.S. expects retaliation in Iraq against its bases. They've done that before. When, when they did it, it was pretty uh, calibrated. And second, the Persian Gulf creates some, some distortions in shipping so that you increase oil prices. And you mentioned the Strait of Hormuz there at the end. I mean, that's widely seen as the next step, partly because Iran itself has indicated that that might be where it's looking in terms of retaliation. But the understanding is that that would have a big impact on China, which is seen as a friendly nation to Iran. Do we have a, an understanding of China's position, what China might be saying to Iran at the moment in terms of whether or not to retaliate? Well, exactly. So um, there's several aspects to that. The first one is, yes, China is going to be part of the conversation with Iran, um, as is Russia, uh, to calibrate and decide on the response. They're not going to do it just, you know, um, without consulting allies. Uh, indeed, that can hurt China because it will, um, you know, increase oil prices. Um, but remember, the Iranian threats are not Iranian government threats right now, not even uh, army threats per se. Uh, the Iran actually, Iran uh, defense forces have said, you know, don't don't listen to what members of the parliament, politicians are saying. We're the one making the calls, and uh, you know, will implement any decision. So, Iran as a government has not decided. There's just threats, you know, from various hardliners. Uh, and in, based on what has happened in the past, they never blocked the Strait of Hormuz, but they disrupted it, meaning they put some limpet mines back in 2018. Of, um, but what has changed, you know, uh, um, is that, again, like you mentioned, China would really take exception to that. But not only China, Saudi Arabia, which is the, the world global exporter, that was a, an enemy really back in 2018 when Iran created disruptions. Again, we think about more sort of, you know, frictions and sabotage rather than closure. Now it's actually a country that is very, in very good terms with, with Iran. So that actually creates more pressure on Iran not to do anything that would, you know, fundamentally disrupt traffic. Yeah, so they could uh, be the held region. They could be held back by, by allies at this particular moment. Uh, just finally Sorry. and briefly, Benoit, uh, we, there's talk about regime change. Donald Trump has, has mentioned it. MIGA, MIGA, depending on how you want to say it. How likely is that, do you think? So first of all, Iranian officials I speak to are, are not ruling out anything. They've seen the Soviet Union. They've seen, you know, Syria. But people I speak to in Iran right now, I mean, it's more a, a life that is disrupted, right? They remote working from their villa in the Caspian Sea. I'm speaking to them on WhatsApp, meaning there is still communications. They're mentioning some degree of inflation, but there is no sense of, even of a collapse of, this, of the system. So I would be very cautious before I reach that conclusion. Yeah, it's really interesting. Benoit, thank you very much for your time.
Thank you. That's Ben Wafok on, who's the Middle East correspondent at the Wall Street Journal. Lots of talk, isn't there, about how this is a, a regime that's much low than the people are ready to, to, to rise up. But whether they'll rise up without massive economic pressures and because Israel and America want them to. And uh, it's unclear what... what regime change would look like and I think what Benoit was saying there is absolutely crucial that if if your life is not overly disrupted it may well be easier to uh, to, to sort of sit tight for the moment. Yeah and, and Donald Trump tweeting about it doesn't necessarily make it so although it makes lots of things so undoubtedly but maybe not that.